Welcome to a story in three parts here at the Kelowna Art Gallery. This exhibition features the work of three artists, um, Kanoyuak Ashavak, Sharni Pudigud, and a Suma Collective represented by Carol Kunick. The exhibition is three connected but different and distinct um, works, uh, practices by Inuit artists, um, two of them being from Kinite, uh, formerly Cape Dorset, and the other uh, from Uglulik. Uh, and um, we'll talk a little more about what each of these uh, components of the exhibition mean and how they connect together. So the exhibition, the component that is Kanoyak Ashavak, features mostly drawings, and all of these drawings inspired prints, and that's the process at the Kinite Studios in Cape Dorset, uh, or Kinite uh, Nunavut, where the artists work with printmakers to take their drawings and translate them into prints, and sometimes the drawing looks a lot like the print. Other times, the drawing is very different from the end result print. And here we have three examples. In the exhibition, there are only three examples um, to give you a sense of that process and how it works. Here we've got a lithograph and two stone cuts. And you can imagine, here is the monochromatic original drawing, and this is what it looks like in print form. And so you can see the decisions that get made in relation to the artist's wishes, the printmaker's abilities, and, you know, again, these are not things that it was never in intended to make a reproduction of the drawing. It was meant to use the drawing as an inspiration in order to then, you know, make a print. And of course, people say, well, why isn't it a reproduction of the drawing? Well, you can do things in drawing that you can't in print and vice versa. So look at these amazing results that we get from, you know, a drawing that looks almost nothing like in a way, from a coloration point of view, it's resulting print. It's interesting, we get the question a lot, you know, do we produce prints after the artist has died? And we've never done that and we won't. Part of the reason is that we want the artist to have a relationship with the printer in order to make decisions collaboratively on what the print is gonna look like in relation to the original drawing. And so you can see here's a very good example, again, a monochromatic but very detailed surface on, these, on, these, on this image, um, translated into stone cuts. So a lot of really, really complex decisions were made in terms of what the color would look like and how it would relate back to the original. And so, of course, you wouldn't be able to do that if you didn't have the printer and the, the artist who draws working together in order to, to produce the final product. And so, yes, you know, always the artist is involved in decision making around, around the production of the prints. It's worth mentioning the stone cut process because stone cut is very, very specific to the Arctic and very specific to Kinite um, studios, almost invented there, I would say. And um, what you have here in the drawing is a very detailed, I like to say filigree treatment of the, of the surface, well, like lots of detailed, almost oscillating uh, line work in pen on paper, ink on paper. So how do you translate that into the final print? Well, if you look at the surface of this print, which is the stone cut of our drawing below, this incredible detail, incredible detail that you get in the surface, mimicking what you can do with pen on paper. Interestingly, the matrix for this, so the surface that's being inked up by the printmaker in order to transfer it onto the paper, is a piece of slate, a flat piece of slate that's been hand incised. Sometimes these things, this would have taken months to do. And if you, you know, look at the detail in the surface, all of those elements that have been carved away have been carved away by hand. So you can imagine the incredible labor that it takes in order to get that effect, all in the interest of representing what the drawing looks like in its print form. This arrangement is really interesting because it speaks to, I think, thematically some of the things that, that Kanoyuak was interested in exploring in her work. Certainly, she was very, very interested in nature, and so the natural world around her, particularly animals. And of course, we can see here, you know, we've got, we've got the loons and we've got the owl, which is, of course, one of her famous, famous, famous um, iconographic elements. Um, her uh, enchanted owl has appeared on, you know, all kinds of different official documents, including the Canadian state. Stamp. And so, of course, she's known for that treatment of her owls. Um, and here, of course, you can see again another owl motif and the way that she's treated these, these, um, these geese, uh, you know, in a, in a serpentine-like way, you know. So there's a little bit of that transformation of, of going from one kind of animal to the other, um, a strange kind of mix-up of, of what you expect and, and what's a surprise to you. Uh, and again, here we get this beautiful, beautiful, um, you know, bird figure with this uh, amazing treatment, again, of the filigree on the the surface. And, and it's interesting, the, the symmetry that you see in 
these two, and, and this one as well, um, it's emblematic of the way that she approached some of her compositions. And, and it's interesting for me, I look at it like it's almost a crest or, or a very a sort of a regal kind of element. Um, and it also gives this, uh, this really interesting kind of insight into how skilled she is as someone who draws. The ability to reproduce this in a very symmetrical uh, manner is, is, is quite fascinating. So this is the work of Sharni Pudigu, the other artist in the exhibition from, from Kinite, um, Cape Dorset, Nunavut. And um, there are some similarities to what we've seen in Kanoyuak's work, particularly, of course, the monochromatic, the, the way that Sharni treats the surfaces of, of these images with that, that um, very detailed, almost oscillating uh, line work. Uh, but of course, the imagery is very different. The treatment of the imagery is very different. Um, Sharni Pudigu was a contemporary of Kanoyuak's, so of course they would have known each other, we've seen each other's work, and much like that process of, of peer-to-peer kind of engagement that's been happening for 60 years at the studios in, in, uh, in Kinite. Um, you know, people see each other's work, the artists, you know, are influenced by each other, you know, you see the influence of, of other artists in the work um, of other artists. And so in this case, certainly there is a connection to, to Kanoyuak, but there is an incredible sense of design and composition here that, that certainly in an, is, is as impressive in a different way as, as we see in the compositions of, of Kanoyuak. You know, a lot of repetition, um, a lot of, of, you know, multiple images. You know, I look at this as, as almost design in a way. And, you know, what we're able to do or what she's able to do and what we're able to see in this work um, is, is a pretty incredible approach to kind of, to image making. And, you know, we, again, we see, you know, some natural elements, you know, but presented in a very kind of almost anthropomorphic way where they're, they're, they're these birds kind of being human. And then we suddenly have these figures that, you know, we don't really know what they are. They look maybe like they're hybrid. Uh, there's a traditional drum, but maybe the costume is some kind of a hybrid or reinterpreted a Mauti or, or traditional parka. Um, and then you get these very brooding, spooky figures, you know, kind of floating around upside down, almost specter-like, you know. So she does have a very uh, interesting and unique way of approaching the world around her. And of course, we have to understand does this come from a study of art history or a study of design? No. You know, all of the artists over the, over the 60 years that the studio has been supporting artists, um, they have never studied traditionally. So art history is not, a, a, in the way that we know it, part of their development. And so this, again, would have been from pure imagination. It would have been a really interesting, um, unique interpretation of what was happening around Sharni at the time. And it's hard to understand unless you were there to, to know what, was, what the influence was. I mean, we can only guess and surmise. And in some ways, I find that the, the thing, the tension in the work that's really interesting, it's kind of, it's, it's our job to really try to understand this on our terms in a way. Sharni's made it for us to contemplate. There's lots to talk about in Sharni's work, and you kind of have to really get into this over time. And there's, you know, examining each one and then one to the other, seeing the what's going on in one that relates to the other, seeing the contradictions that are happening in, in one drawing, and then, you know, what's going on in another. You know, but again, the, the, she has this incredible sense of, of like there's fancy and comedy and, you know, but bringing it back to some of those core kind of values and traditions of Inuit work. And in this case, you've got, you know, these, these, you know, dancing figures who are clearly kind of humans that are animal heads. And it's interesting to note that because, again, you see that in a lot of Sharni's work. And, of course, you see it in a lot of Inuit work. And that's part of the transformation uh, mythology where, you know, humans become animals and vice versa. And I think this is a, a really... Um, fresh, interesting, new, different kind of take on that traditional transformation um, mythology, where suddenly you've got you know something that you wouldn't normally see in terms of a a person turning into a, a, a whale, or a person turning into a seal, or a person turning into a a, a, um, 
a polar bear. I mean, in this case, you've got humans turning into something that we're unfamiliar with, and that's kind of what makes it, you know, bizarre and interesting at the same time. And, and I think, you know, and looking at, at this is kind of a unique composition because it, it isn't that repetition of pattern, that repetition of elements. And, you know, again, what we see is addressing, you know, very traditional kind of wildlife, something that you would see, perhaps inspired by something you would see in the Arctic, but looking nothing like the original reference, clearly. I mean, this could be a ptarmigan, this could be, you know, a, a, a Arctic, uh, an Arctic goose, this could be, it could be a, a chicken, for that matter, that, w that she remembered from a visit to the south. It's, um, but again, in a very interesting and unique way rendered um, for the drawing. Now, we're here at the third component of a story in three parts, and this is a Summa Collective, represented by, uh, represented by Carol Kunick, um, and the film is A Life to Live For, uh, and it represents the story of an incredibly tragic moment in, in Aglulik. Uh, Aglulik is a, a, a town in, in Nunavut, um, and it represents uh, what happened during a famine in this town of Iglulik, and Iglulik in, in Anuttatuk is translated to um, a place of rotting meat. And there is a reason why, and that's something that you'll have to discover when you, when you see the, the video itself. But it does speak to the resilience of a community and some of the realities of living in the north. And Isuma is an interesting um, organization. It's a collective of artists. They are filmmakers, video makers. They represented Canada last year at the Venice Biennale, the first uh, Inuit artist to represent Canada at the Biennale. So quite significant in that respect. And the idea, we've included uh, Usuma in order to provide a counterpoint to the more traditional two-dimensional works on paper that we find in the other two components of the, of the exhibition. And this speaks to this notion, again, of a continuous narrative around the development of Inuit art in Canada where you have, again, the beginnings of Inuit art, you know, represented by Kanoyuak, you know, the continuation uh, of that practice by her peer, Sharni, and then what do we see now happening in Inuit art, representing new media, representing, you know, different ways of disseminating, um, you know, the, the voices of Inuit, uh, Inuit creators and the voices of Inuit communities in the North, using something like television and, and video as a means to get that information out. Both Kanoyuak Ashavak and Sharni Pudigut were member artists of the West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative's Kinite Studios. Um, West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative was established in 1959 as a means of developing economy in the region. Um, it's perplexing for a lot of us how visual art became the thing that developed economy in, in the Canadian Arctic, in the West Baffin region. Um, it, this could have been anything. It could have been natural resources. It could have been, you know, whatever other things you could do in the, in the Canadian Arctic. And, and it's, again, it's even, um, it's almost perverse to think that, that visual arts was determined to be uh, this, this machine that was going to, to build economy and to create a salary for artists. And for 60 years, Years, it's done just that. It's an extraordinary story. And for me, it speaks to two things. One is the transformative nature of, of the visual arts, the fact that you can actually have the visual arts change a community, a community that was ultimately, in the beginnings, um, you know, were languishing. I mean, they had been forced relocated from other places in the Arctic, and the studios was developed, again, to bring people together, to provide them with, with something to do and something to make money. So you can imagine what a tremendous, tremendous story. The other is the incredible resilience of the Inuit communities and the fact that they not only accepted making art, it became something that they, that they you know, it, it was synthesized into the community. So that whole ownership from the very beginning, I think, is, is what made um, art making a strength for the community of, of West Baffin. Um, and as we developed the studios over a period of time, beginning again in 1959, in the 1970s, we established an office in Toronto um, under the, the title of Dorset Fine Arts. It is still the West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative, operating under a different name. Um, and the job of that office 
office where I'm mostly located is to distribute, to market, you know, work in the world. And that was a remarkable, remarkable decision. And talk about vision of the board of directors and all Inuit board of directors of the, of the cooperative. It's always been uh, an all Inuit board deciding that it's more expeditious for us to relate to the rest of the world by having an outpost in Toronto where we can be more nimble, we can be, you know, in places in the world much more easily than trying to travel out of the Arctic. Can you imagine the challenges of living in the Arctic, the challenges of shipping from the Arctic to the rest of the world, the challenges of, of you know, cost effectiveness in the Arctic. So really remarkable, the decision that the board made in the 1970s in order to, to develop um, the uh, head office, further develop their head office in, in Cape Dorset in Kenite, um, and to have a satellite office in downtown Toronto. And, you know, it's, it's fascinating because these studio systems, it was meant to be a program that was rolled out across the Arctic. And, you know, in a way, it makes sense that it didn't prosper everywhere because solutions don't fit every circumstance. And, and for me, people ask, well, why did it work in Cape Dorset? Why did, did um, this prosper and in other places it didn't? I mean, there's lots of answers to that. I think that the community itself is where you have to go for those answers. And I think it's because the community really felt strongly about this creative impulse that they had, the ability to take the experiences that they, they, they all have and to be able to use those experiences as the foundations of their creative expression. And it's really interesting because Kanoyuak, one of the famous quotes from Kanoyuak is, I, I didn't know that I wanted to be an artist. I just knew I had to feed my family. So what you have is this amazing moment where need and necessity meet this idea of creative expression. And that's, I think, what makes this whole narrative of the West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative, Kinite Studios, and the the success of West Baffin artists. Uh, that's, and it, I don't think you have this narrative anywhere else in the world in a lot of ways. We talked about, about the West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative and its work in building economy within the, the local community. And I think there are parallels to the reason that Asuma exists. Asuma's job was to provide the skills um, for community members in the Glulik region and in other places in the Arctic, but particularly in the Glulik region, in order for them to understand how they could use technology, how they could use documentary filmmaking and filmmaking in general, fiction, film as well, um, to tell their stories. And so in a way, USUMA provided the capacity for the community to be able to reflect on itself, to reflect on its history, and ultimately to get that history into the eyes and ears of people across the world. Now, it's been a real thrill working on this exhibition. It's been a real thrill talking about this exhibition. There's lots and lots of connections between the three components of our story. Um, and I guess thanking everyone here at the Kelowna Art Gallery is something that I need to do. And, you know, um, it's been an amazing working relationship and, and a thrill to present this exhibition here. And, of course, I, I also want to thank the three artists, posthumously, of course, um, Kanoyak Ashavak and Sharni Pudigut, for allowing us to have this work and to experience it even after after their deaths this is still part of a creative legacy that we can that we can experience and we can still grow with and and changes in meaning as the world changes around it and of course Asuma Collective and Carol Kunuk um, you know this is a tremendous statement about you know w these incredible stories that happen in the Arctic an incredible statement around um, you know the resilience of Inuit communities and really as again as much as it reflects on the history this really is is about the stories that we need to know now, um, the things that are happening in the Arctic. So our story in three parts really, again, tells us three separate but very connected, and these are things that you know happen over time, and it gives us the progression of what we're seeing in the Arctic and what we can expect to see in the future in the Arctic.